Hi everyone, I'm Jose Valim, and today I want to share with you a new tool that we have been working on at Dashbit called Livebook. So Livebook is an interactive and collaborative code notebook application. It's implemented in Elixir uh, with Phoenix Live View, so you can run it in your machine, it's open source, and you'll be able to, after you run it, you'll be able to access Livebook directly in your browser. So that's exactly what I have done. I'm running notebook on my machine, a uh, Livebook on my machine, and um, yeah, and it's a web app. This is the, the, the home page. And let's jump straight to it. Let's create a new notebook and see how it works. So as a code notebook, we can do, you know, very basic things such as adding uh, a title to it. And then we can start creating our section. So let's start an introduction section. And we can start adding some markdown cells, right? This is uh, markdown. And we can also add some Elixir cells, right? So I can say, hey, I want to print Hello World and then I want to execute it. And you can see that it prints uh, Hello World and returns the result of this function, right? So far, so good. But uh, in order to show how Livebook really, really works, let's build something concrete, okay? And what I want to build is that I want to redo the talk that I did two months ago. So two months ago, I gave a talk at Lambda Days where I built a neural network from scratch using the NX library. So NX is a new library for Elixir that stands for Numerical Elixir and is meant to be a set of building blocks for us to build um, applications for Elixir that rely on numerical computing. So, uh, you know, for example, machine learning related applications. That's the example that I picked. So in my talk, what I did is that I built a neural, ne neural network from scratch to work against the MNIST data set, okay? So that's what I want to do today as well, but instead of building the neural network from scratch, I want to use the Exxon library that was released by Sean Moriarty uh, a week ago, uh, last week. And the Exxon library, it's a library that is high level building blocks for building neural networks in Elixir, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So let's get started. Since, um, so I'm going to create a new section. And since we are going to use the Exxon library, we are going to use NX. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to list our dependencies, okay? So I'm going to copy and paste it so you don't have to see me typing. So I'm going to copy paste some Elixir code and I'm going to install those dependencies. And we can see here that this declaration is a little bit verbose, right? But that's because those packages, they have not been released yet. If they were released, we'll be able to do just this, just list the dependency and um, and its requirement, the version that we want, okay? And here you can already see the first difference with Livebook is that uh, dependency management, it is explicit, okay? So every time you want to install the dependencies, you need to call mix install. And mix install is a new function coming in Elixir 1.12. Uh, we have the release candidate out right now. And, um, and this is very much intentional. So in Elixir, we have a package manager since version 1.0 came out, but the only way you could use those packages, the only way you could use those dependencies would be if you started a project and listed that in a project, right? Because we never really enjoyed global dependencies. The issue with global dependencies and having things that depend on your system is that, you know, maybe you get a new machine, maybe you want to share a script with somebody and a notebook with somebody. And if that script, that notebook is relying on global dependencies, it's going to be hard to reproduce the results. Okay, so uh, mix install is meant to solve this problem. It's meant to make sure that we can easily add dependencies in our scripts, in our notebooks, and uh, still have that listed there very explicitly so we can still share them and reproduce the results elsewhere. So I have listed mix install, I have executed the code, it installed the dependencies, and now we can move forward to use those dependencies, okay? So let's get started. So uh, in order for us to build and actually to train a neural network, what we need to do is that we need to download two data sets. So one are the training images. So in our case, the MNIST data set is a data set with images representing digits, right? Like the digits zero, one, two, three, four, five, representing numbers, okay? And, um, and we, so we need to download this data set with the images 
And we also need to download the label data set that's going to tell us, hey, this is a five, this is a zero, this is a one, this is a four, and so on. So let's do that, okay? So uh, I'm going again to copy the URL here so you don't have to see me typing all this. So I'm going to download this data set. So I'm going to download the train images. And let's execute this to see how that request is going to look like. So you can see that it returns a topo for us with, you know, the, 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 the response header and then, you know, all, all the response headers in the list, the actual HTTP headers, and then the body that we want to download at the very end, okay? So let's better match on that. So we know it's a topo with okay, the status uh, and the headers that we don't care about, and we have the train body here, okay? So let's assign that to a variable. Let's execute this again. And now we hopefully have the, the body of the request in the train body, body variable. So let's continue working on that. I know that this is uh, gzipped, so we need to extract, to extract it. I'm going to use the module zlib that comes with Erlang. So let's call uh, gunzip on the train body, and that's going to unpack it. And you can see that it's returning now some binary blob for us. And I know from experience that this binary blob, the first four bytes, okay, is an identifier that we don't care about. The next four bytes is going to tell how many images we have in this data set. And then it's the next four bytes are going to tell us how many rows each of those images have, and then how many columns those um, images have. And finally, I want to get the rest of the binary is going to be just to be this blob of images, which I'm going to reassign to the train, train by variable here. So let's execute this and let's print those values just so we can take a look at them, okay? So we can see that we have a data set with 60,000 images and they are 28 per 28. Okay, so far so good. So let's continue iterating on this. So now we have the train body and this is a blob, right? This is just all the images one right after the other. So we want to give us a little bit more structure to this. So the first thing, and, and the way we're going to give more structure to this is to convert it to a multi-dimensional uh, array, right? We're going to convert it to a tensor where, the, where one dimension is going to keep it, each image and then the other dimension is going to keep each row, is going to keep the rows, entries, and then the columns. Okay, so let's convert it to a tensor. And to do that, we can use the, we are going to use an X and we're going to call from binary. And we know that each element in, in, in this blob is a byte, okay? So it, it's a byte representing um, those images as we're going to see, they are monochromatic. So it's a byte representing like, hey, is, if it's zero, it's black. And if it's uh, 255, that's going to be white or the opposite, okay? So it's just a scale. So let's do that. Let's create a tensor. And you can see that it really created a really large tensor, right? Because it's just a single dimension for now with, you know, uh, 47 million entries or something like that. So, um, okay. Now let's, uh, now that we have created this, this binary blob, what we are going to do is that let's give some shape to it. So I'm going to call reshaping here. And uh, the first dimension is going to be the number of images, then we're going to give the number of rows, and then we're going to give the number of columns. So you can see that now it starts resembling something multidimensional, right? Where we have a dimension for the images and so on. And in order for us to actually see the images, let's get a heat map out of this, right? And you can actually see here that we get like, hey, this is the number five, this is the number four, this is the number sorry, this is number zero, this is the number four, this is the number one. So we got the heat map of those images, which is really, really nice. So, um, okay, so we're starting to work with the data set and we're starting to, to bring some shape to things. Let's structure this a little bit more now before we move ahead. So I want to allocate everything before the heat map um, to, be, uh, to be a tensor. And that's where we're going to get the heat map for. And also what we're going to do is that when we are working with neural networks, it's common for us to normalize the data to be between zero and one, right? We don't want to send like high values like 255 or even bigger than that because that may make our network goes towards infinity or something like that. So it's common for us to normalize it. So let's divide everything by 255. So everything's between zero and one. And I'm going to run this again. And you should see now we once again, we get the heat map, everything's still the same but we have, we can see that the type changed to a float 32, okay? Fantastic, we are done with the training image and now we have to do the same thing, uh, but we are going to do it for 
uh, the labels, okay? So first thing I need to do is that I need to download the labels. I'm going to, uh, once again, uh, copy and paste the URL, okay? So if I copy and paste it here, let's execute it. We got a response. And again, we're going to pattern match on it. So we are going to get the status. We're getting the headers and we're going to get the label body this time. So let's make this a little bit prettier. Let's run this again. So we put uh, the label body into the proper variable. And now we can work on it. And again, it's going to be very similar. The first thing that we want to do is that we want to zip it. We know it's, uh, it's zipped. And again, the first four bytes is an identifier that we don't care about. And then the next four bytes is the number of labels. And we know how many labels we expect, right? We expect to have exactly 60,000 labels, the same number of images. And then I'm going to assign the rest to label body again. Let's run this and let's see how many labels we got. We got exactly 60,000. Beautiful. Okay, so let's continue moving forward. So, um, so what we're going to do is the same thing. We are going to create a tensor. Okay, so let's start with the label body. Oops. Let's start with the label body and let's create a tensor. And again, each entry in this blob that we have with the labels, it's going to be a byte, right? It's a byte. So uh, it's the same type, it's U8. Um, and if I run this, you can see that now we have a tensor and you can see exactly that we got a five, a, a zero, a four, a one, exactly the images that we saw. So this is good. And, but there is one thing. Um, our neural network, it's not going to say, hey, this is a five. It's not going to, to say this is a zero, right? This is not the output that we are going to get from our neural network. Instead, what our neural network is going to return is that it's going to return a list of probabilities. It's going to say, hey, I am like 60% um, sure that this is a five, right? And, you know, maybe uh, 20 per and I think like 20%, I think that this maybe is a three or something like that. Okay, so um, so this is not the output that we're going to get. So we need to change this slightly. We want this to be a list of probabilities. And in this case, because it's, you know, we we have looked at those images, we are like 100% sure that this is a five, right? So let's, so let's convert this format. So let's reshape it, okay? And when we reshape it, the first thing that we're going to do is that we are going to wrap each of those values in a list, okay? So now, uh, you can see that I have a list with five. So this is a good first step after reshaping. I have a list with five, a list with zero. And now I want to convert this list with five to be a list with zero, 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 one, right? Where the position for the number five is going to be one. And the way to do that is that we just need to compare each of those rows, right? That we have here um, to, to a tensor that we are going to build um, from getting from zero to nine, right? So if we compare those, we can. It's going to be one. It's going. They are going to be equal exactly when we have the number five. So we can see now that this is a list saying, "Hey, I am a hundred percent sure, right? I a hundred percent. The probability is one here. A hundred percent that this is the number five. A hundred percent this is the number zero. A hundred percent is the number four, and so on. Okay. So all right, that's our uh, label tensor. Let's assign that into a variable. And um, this is it. We have our uh, train tensor. We have our label tensor. So now all we need to do is that we need to implement our neural network and then we're going to be able to train it. So let's keep going ahead. So in order to uh, build our neural network, we are going to use Axon. And as I said, Axon is a high level library for building neural networks in Elixir. And, um, and, they are, and it has both, the, we can, either build a model or use its, its building blocks to build the network from scratch, we are going to go the high level approach. We are going to do the model, okay? So the first thing that we need to declare here is our inputs. And our inputs, we know that it's something like this, right? We have 60,000 images per 28 per 28. But here's the thing, we never give all the 60,000 images at once to the neural network. We, we break them into small batches which we are going to decide later on. So I'm going to say, look, the batch dimension is going to be new. And then uh, because our neural network is a very simple neural network, it doesn't actually understand like rows and columns in an image. So I'm going to flatten those. We don't care about those. And then I'm going to say, uh, we're going to have a hidden layer, okay? Uh, with 128 units and the activation, activation function here is going to be a sigmoid. 
and we are going to have another dense layer. This is the output layer. So therefore it needs to have the size of 10, right? One for each image. Okay, which digit that we want to recognize. And the activation function is going to be softmax. Okay, so let's execute this. And we can see that it's printing the model that we just built really nicely uh, with all the parameters, the shape and so on. And, um, and I know that I am sailing through this, right? I'm not explaining the details. So you can go watch my talk, as I said, in Lambda Days where I built it from scratch. I go more into details, you know, what are those activation functions, how they look like, and so on. But this is good enough for now. We have already built our new network model. And with our new network model in hand, we can actually go ahead and train it, okay? And the first thing that I need to do uh, to train is, as I said, okay, we don't, we, we're not going to give all 60,000 images at once, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is that we, we are going to convert our train tensor into a list of smaller tensors, right? So, uh, so it's going to be a list uh, of, instead of 60,000 images, it's going to be a list of tensors with 32 images list uh, each. Okay, so you can see here, instead of being 60,000, it's 32. That's our first uh, batch. This is our second batch and so on. And we are going to do the same thing for the labels. Okay, so we are going to create another uh, batch at least with our label tensor and again of 32. And now we can train it. Okay, so to train it, we're going to start with the model. And the first thing that we do is that we define uh, the training step. And we're going to define a train step with um, our optimization function. And because this is a neural network that is returning us, it, we say it's multiple categories, right? It's either a zero, a one, a two, or three, it's not binary. So we are going to use the categorical cross entropy uh, um, function here to that we're, it's going to build on top of the laws. It's going to help us train this neural network. And in order to optimize the neural network itself, because when we have a neural network, we want to minimize the loss, we want to, it to be as precise as possible. I'm going to use a very simple algorithm here. Uh, and Axon has things that are more efficient than these, like Adam, for example. But I'm going to use the same that I, as I used in the talk two months ago, which is the stoch stochastic gradient descent uh, with 0 0.1, okay? Uh, with the step of 0 0.0.1. So that's our training step. And uh, now that we define this trap, we can, the step, we can effectively train it. So I'm going to give it the train batch. I'm going to give it the label batch. I'm going to make it go through uh, 10 epochs, okay, 10 rounds. And what I'm going to use here is that I'm going to use the EXLA compiler, right? So at the beginning, I listed three dependencies, right? I listed, um, I listed NX that we use, we listed Exxon and I listed EXLA, that's what we are using here. And I'm going to explain what it does soon. Let's just make this run because it takes like uh, 10 seconds or so. And um, so the result of training is going to be the train parameters and the training state that we don't care about. So let's run this. And you can see that the box, they are going very fast because this is a quite simple neural network. And um, and the reason why it's going, the other reason it's going very fast is that we are using XLA. The XLA, it's bindings for the Google XLA. Google XLA stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra. It's a tensor compiler that can get all the code that we've written in the neural network and compile it just in time to run on the CPU or on the GPU. Okay, so this makes it quite fast. And as I was talking, we can see we are done training the neural network. Okay, and you can see that it went for all 10 epochs and it returned the train parameters. So we can actually see if it works. Okay, so uh, let me start another elixir section here. And I want, now that we have the train parameters, let's try to predict, okay? And what I'm going to do is that let's predict the first batch, right? Because we know how it looks like, right? We know that it is a five, a zero, a four, and so on. So let's give the train parameters when we are predicting and let's give the first batch in our list of batches. So now that I execute this, okay, uh, you can see that it's returning a list of probabilities for the first one. And you can see that in this list of probabilities, it's saying, hey, I am like 57% sure that this is the number five, which is good because it is a number five, right? And I'm, and I'm like 99.7% sure that this is the number zero, right? And then, um, and then, you know, 88% sure that this is the number four. We can actually 
use argmax here on the, the the second axis to tell us the results and you can see it's a five a zero a four a one exactly what we expected so you know we were able to to train a new network and i know that i'm giving the training data to predict that's not ideal but it's good enough for now okay so that's it we've you know we, we we've trained a neural network directly from livebook right and everything was very interactive okay and um and i hope you have enjoyed it but i'm not done yet not quite yet there are a couple of other features that i want to show to you uh, of things that we can do with livebook so the first one is the next one rather uh that i want to show is that you can actually run tests inside livebook so let, let's show an example so first i'm going to define a module in here called uh hello i'm going to define a function called world and then it's going to return this string hello world okay i'm going to execute this code and now you're going to write tests for this code so the first thing that we need to do is that we need to start the x unit uh, test framework that comes as part of elixir and we need to pass a flag in here say auto run false because the way it works in in elixir is that x unit the defaults are tailored for the command line so when you load your tests before the command line exits what it does is that automatically runs a test so the tests for you so we want to disable this behavior and now we can define our test cases as usual right so let's say hello test and we can say use x unit uh, case we can make it async if you want and we can define our tests let's have a very simple task that, that check that it works and we want to assert that um, we want to assert that hello road is going to return the string hello road and i'm going to add a exclamation mark here okay just to make this test fail and now after you, you could define multiple tests across multiple snippets and when we are done we can call x unit run and that's going to run all the test cases that we have defined so let's run this and you can see that you know it has just executed the test for us and it failed right and it's showing it's comparing the left side with the right side the, the left side with the right side and it's showing look it's missing this character right we have this additional character so let's fix it let's fix the code okay let's add this here and let's let's reevaluate the cell and what you can see here that now that we have evalu evaluated the cell again the cell below it all the cells below it they are marked as a stale and this is the way that livebook is showing like hey you know you changed some code before and that code before is going it is going to change the results of the other cells most likely if you run them again so i'm marking this as a stale so there is a very visual clear indication that this cell is you know the results of the cell is depending on the stale code so if i run this cell again you can see now that the stale code has been removed and that our tests have passed okay which is uh, great news um what else uh, there are other cool things other cool things that we can do with livebook so we have seen so far how it is interactive but we haven't seen how it is collaborative so let's take a look at that so let me take this from free screen and what i'm going to do is that i'm going to open up another tab in here um, and let's have those things side by side let's open up the same notebook in here and it is collaborative because as you can see here you know as i have this notebook on the side here if i come here and i start doing some changes like i add a new markdown section we can see that the other side is automatically updated as we are changing things and this is a good opportunity to show another feature we also have support for math formulas uh, via ktex so if i add a more a math formula it appears on both sides you know if i add some elixir code it's going to continue appearing uh, on both sides and i can actually work together on the same code at the same time right you can see that each place is in a different cursor and then we can collaborate uh, while uh, writing some code so really collaborative um, features right here from the beginning um and yeah so this is it oh i have one last thing i actually want to share with you so let me go back to first screen which is okay you you know you started this 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 notebook you started this live book you collaborated together 
but what do you do now, right? You have to save it, right? You have to persist this live book somewhere. So we can do that. I can come here right now. You can see that the notebook is on memory only, but I can say, hey, I want to save to file and I'm going to save it to a file called example. And you can see that it created a example.live uh, MD file. And live MD stands for live markdown. It is effectively a subset of markdown. So just for fun, what we're going to do is like, let's use Elixir to to read uh, the let's let's use live book itself to read the file that it saved okay so uh, we are going to read example.livemd and we are going to print it um, and we can see here that the contents of this file is just marked now so you know we have the title we have the sections we have all the code that we wrote right everything is here in this live, live markdown file and um, and, and the, the only reason why it's a subset is because it has some restrictions, like you can't have at the moment code between the title and the first section, right? Like if you have any HTML in it, we are going to discard it when we load it for security reasons. So there are some restrictions, but it's mostly marked now. And that's the important part, right? Because it means that after you're done with your work, you can save to a file that you can ship to your colleagues and your colleagues, they can, if they don't have live book enabled, if they don't have live book running, they can just look at the file and see what you wrote and what you are trying to explain, right? Um, or for example, if you want to commit this to a GitHub repository, it's going to be readable, right? You can check it on GitHub. If somebody sends a pull request, you can review the, the notebook directly in the pull request without having to bring it to your machine. You can make suggestions, you can make change. So yeah, so this is the live book format. Um, and, um, and you can just persist it anywhere you want. So yeah, I believe that now it's, uh, it's for real. This is it. Uh, so, uh, some final wor uh, words, um, first of all, a huge thank you to Jonathan Kuosko. He has joined Dashbit to work on live books. So this is the result of his work. Uh, amazing work. Thank you, Jonathan. And it's worth saying that this is just the initial vision, right? Of what we have. Uh, in mind uh, for live book, right? We say that it's interactive and it's collaborative and we're able to get some ideas about how it is interactive and collaborative during this presentation, right? But it's uh, it's going to be much more than that. So for example, um, we saw some collaboration, but there was like no visual indicator of how many people were working on the notebook. So that's something that we want to work on next, right? And we really want to make it interactive so you can actually, and not interactive only for like a numerical computing or machine learning, but really interactive because uh, the software that we write in Elixir, it's a live system, right? We have processes, we have supervision trees, and we want to make it easy for you to interact with those entities and see how those entities, they are behaving. So uh, we have a bunch of ideas in this area. Right, and I hope you, even though it's still our first step on this journey, I hope you have enjoyed it. And we not only show live book, but we talked about live book, we talked about Exxon, which is this high level library for building neural networks in Elixir. And we even showcase some features that are coming in the next Elixir version, Elixir 1.12. And I hope you could see how all those features, they are starting to, um, you know, to work together to bring this really compelling uh, development experience. Uh, thanks for your time and I hope you have enjoyed it. Bye.